Greetings everyone, I'm Mr. Muckle Lover, and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO, The Last Days of Europe, in which we are going to be playing now as the Kingdom of England. Now, normally I show you the beginning of the campaign, the world itself, from the very beginning of the starting screen, but I chose not to this time just because loading screens take a while. But let's begin with some research. We only have three research slots. It's 1962, and it looks like we are a little bit uh, behind on the times in terms of... Uh, Research, industry, all that type of good stuff. Let's see, do we want horizontal or in vertical industrial organization? Less cap, less growth. I prefer less growth over less cap. I like the cap. Uh, we could do that, but uh, yeah, let's grab that one. No land doctrine to begin with. And let's go over to the free civilian factories. Well, with the path we're going, so with the English here, we have basically two paths. We stay with the government, basically, or we get a little bit rebellious through our focuses. So tick tock, tick tock, the surrender of the UK at the end of the war unfortunately was not enough to keep dissidents quiet in England. Though many attempted conspiracies have been crushed over the years and it looked like we might finally be past the dark times following the third battle of Cable Street, in recent years a new organization has waged war from the shadows, pretentiously titled Her Majesty's Most Loyal Resistance. They along with the left resistance has been a thorn in the side like none other. Assassinations, falsified anti-government propaganda, and even bombings by the H. MMLR have become increasingly common and things are starting to get out of hand, but the king is set to make a speech on the matter soon, which hopefully will help us turn public opinion to our point of view. So, with that being said, we have a choice. We can either go with the, uh, let's see, HMMLR, or we just kind of stick with the government. Now, in this campaign, we're going to stick with the government because I don't know what's going to happen. I've played this path before, and it's not bad. I will do another camp, at least one more campaign eventually as a kingdom of England in which we do do the HMMLR but this is not this campaign the one I play England again someday we will go down that path uh, let's see do we need APCs we might we definitely need anti-tank we need some basic infantry rifles we need some support equipment we need some motorized some early ooh, early motorized that's not good artillery is great anti-air I'm going to ignore for now uh, let's see early helicopters early experimental helicopters ooh probably don't need those uh, main battle tanks. We are using IFVs. I might want to use actually tanks eventually. So, did I just not? I clicked on IFVs and the tanks disappeared. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll go with uh, tanks. Maybe we'll make tanks eventually. But what is unique is now that you can put up to five by four, so twenty factories per slot. So let's get some fighters, basic fighters, basic carrier fighters, because we do have a carrier still. We'll get one close air support. And we'll get one of that as well, So, which means we are left over with a few extra things. We're not going to use tactical bombers in this campaign, I think. I don't really want them for now. And we don't really want to build up another bigger military, because that's going to cost us. You have to pay attention to your economy in TNO. But we're going to make a better military. And if we organize our units, as you can see here, we have the Royal Military Police, 6 combat width, which is not very good. More like police units. We have normal infantry, which is 8 combat width, which is good support companies, but itself is not very good. And we have artillery only, literally artillery only, which I still have yet to do in a campaign. Maybe someday, but... And then we have the IFVs, which has infantry, elite infantry in there as well, which I don't know why they're in there, but whatever. So I split them up accordingly. And just in case, you know, we always are going to need a few more guns. Put some more anti-tank on there. Put some more support equipment. Motorize, I can kind of wait, probably. Ordnance, uh, go up to two, go up to two. I would like to change out the IFVs for tanks. Maybe eventually, carrier fighters, we just keep it on one. I always keep it on one. There's no point, no more point to do that. And we shall finish with dockyards. Now, let's see. We have carriers here, which takes... Oh my goodness, those don't look very good. Our earlier carrier, we don't care about that. Get those with that type of stuff, we don't care about... What we could probably use is a battleship, even though battleships are pretty much outdated by this point. But this looks pretty good. At least it looks okay-ish for now. Uh, yeah, it's probably a waste to even make this. Honestly, the Navy doesn't even matter that much in, in TNO, that, to be honest with you. So, this is early battleship level Edward the Eighth class ship. Uh, this has a higher number. I'm probably going to go with a higher number. Let's go ahead and try that. Why not? And let's let time go on because... We need things to do, but before we do that, military spending, I'm going to cut. And if we have liquid reserves, we currently have an annual deficit, which is not good. Uh, I am building up, before we begin, civilian factories in London, because we're going to try to hold on to London as much as possible. We're going to increase the budget already. Uh, maybe I should not have done that. Good civilian spending. We'll be fine. We'll be fine where we're going. Because we're going to need some political power. And we're losing political power as we speak right now, as I'm training some ships as well. And our, Actually, it's good to look at this, because... 
our GDP is shrinking. We are literally in a depression right now. Literally a depression. Our annual debt is, it is what it is. I mean, for me, I personally love getting rid of debt, but I'm going to try something different in this campaign. I'm not going to focus on getting rid of the debt, but investing our liquid reserves, just going straight into GDP and see what happens as a result of that, you know? Last time I played as like Heydrich's Germany, I played as Vyatka reforming the Russian Empire, which was really awesome. But let's try just investing numbers into GDP, both the copper and the rubble. Uh, actually, you know what? We'll, we'll read that as soon as we do this one. So. The Prime Minister speaks. England is a nation of compromise. Our very existence is dependent on the fact that the Germans considered it not worthy, worth the effort to puppet us like the Dutch or the Norwegians. Regardless of some of our fellows' opinions on the matter of furthering or lessening the ties to our benefactors across the channel, our first priority must be the continued survival of England above all else. The King may think he can calm the recent tension with a speech and a proud word, but we know better. These tensions represent an existential threat to our nation's survival. Let us instead use this opportunity to secure the government's position and point out that we do not have the capacity to fight Germany, no matter what the world would-be rebels say. Uh, we we're going to play as a government side. It includes preparing a safe speech for Edward. Give us the ability to monitor the HMMLR's territorial control via the decisions and the man with a plan. So... So we must keep an eye on this. Timothy O. Fialarty considers himself about as normal as one could be under the circumstances. He'd left school once he could read and write, followed his dad into being a bobby once he met the age requirements, got to the rank of inspector, and even found a nice lass to settle down with. But the rest of the world, Tim happened to think the rest of the world wasn't so normal at all. The police hadn't changed so much since the German invaded. Tim had never gotten the chance to fight, alone and surrender before the Germans reached his unit's position. But he'd known more than a few good men who didn't live to see the war's end in his eyes. It was what had come after that had been worse, the London Uprising, not to mention the constant terrorism, not by the Fenians, but by the Englishmen against their own German tyrants, and Tim had to stop them, but whatever he thought of the government, they had a point. The, rebel winning, the rebels winning might as well end in the Germans coming back, and for his wife and daughter's sake, he'd do anything to prevent that. Passing Inspector of Laerty was Griselda Robbins, a young woman whom the police would probably put a great amount of effort finding if they knew who she was. Griselda had grown up under the boo. She watched the Germans kill her friends in the London Uprising and watched her brother beg on the streets because he couldn't earn a living with his leg blown off. No matter what the government promised, the Germans hadn't left. Which was why she joined the HMMLR. It hadn't been easy. Griselda had followed rumors for months before they noticed her. And after she passed the test of loyalty, she ended up joining the local cell. London might be the home for the traitors after all, but they were an arrogant bunch who couldn't even notice those moving beneath their feet. The die is cast. And let's see what we can do. Hopefully the economy doesn't go down the tubes. Hopefully we don't end up in a very, very bloody civil war that'll split Yorkshire from London and East and Mid West Midlands. And we'll see what happens. You never know. We might just crash the economy by the end of this. Have a good time for everyone, right? We only have... Oh my gosh, look at those expenditures. Military spending is less than a billion. Civilian spending is 4.8, basically. Construction spending is merely 1.3. What are these other expenditures? Uh, but let's read the uh, next focus before we do that. So, anyone, anything. One might suppose that the people ought to be grateful for the government signing a peace that ended the war, but those who remember when it was Britain, and not England, think differently. Of course, it isn't the job of the pol policemen to criticize the government's choices, but perhaps a more secure method of informing the people that everything is fine could have been used, as in not a speech by the king to thousands of people. Never mind the rest to his majesty, but the rest of quotas are simply getting ridiculous. How on earth are the police supposed to hold half the former protesters in London for a couple of weeks before the event, not to mention the proposals about blocking off Cable Street. With no extra manpower to cover it, still, it's a policeman's job to obey orders not to make them. Hopefully, the speech will actually calm down the rebel somewhat. We get guns, political power, and hard work. And now we must come over here and look at the state of the nation. We have strength in London, strength around here in Oxfordshire and Sussex, which actually, playing England now and a little bit before I started recording, has really helped me learn the geography of London, which is awesome. Now, obviously, the HMMLR is in the north. We are in the south, south-east-ish. And we have the government, government Cornwall relations, which is interesting. Oh, we're, oh, we're related with Cornwall. Cool. And we must keep an eye on this. But first, the man with a plan. Of course, the idiot had decided to do a speech. Prime Minister Alexander Douglas Holm cussed in the privacy of his own head. Sometimes he really did wish that the Germans hadn't demanded they put the sorry fop of a King George's elder brother back on the throne and instead allowed them to keep the man who knew how to be a good king on occasion, though. Holm even wished that he'd never been talked into accepting the post of Prime Minister in the first place. Four years might be the longest term served of anyone since the war, but they had been truly horrendous four years indeed. But it wasn't going to be his problem for much longer, he supposed. What was the harm in letting the fool say some fancy words to calm a population who, by and large, despised him? Time for a sip of coffee. Hmm. 
That said, Holm did have to make sure that the king finished his speech alive. The peace with the Germans was tenuous, and Holm did not know how the garrison in Cornwall might react to the death of the monarch when there was no clear air. The slimy bastard Hedler was like a fish when it came to reading his expressions. All gaping, gapping, gaping, non noise, and nothing intelligible. It came down to ensuring that the HMMLR didn't interfere something easier said than done. Progress had been made ever since home had put Philby on the case of finding the rats that would bring England to its doom. But it was a slow thing. They hid up in the north, where the traitorous Scots could covertly support them and where his own government had less influence than they ought to amongst the endless sacks of industrial towns and rugged wilderness. But that home reflected was a problem for another day. Time to decide what the king's speech ought to be about. A traitor or a savior. It depends upon your point of view. Our oh, dear Prime Minister. So here, the king's speech. Uh, Edward's going to be giving a speech to the people. Uh, to calm them about these uncertain days, but there are rumors that the resistance group might intend to disrupt the event. And our intelligence is to be believed it's a bit more than just rumors. Safety measures have been put in place to guard against all possibilities of threats against his majesty or his government. A crackdown on the group or organizations and businesses shall begin in a gallant constabulary or cops will begin efforts to root out any of the more deeply hidden cells. More than anything, we must prevent the government from appearing unstable, else the consequences could be dire indeed. We have 500 guns, periodic change, that does not look good. Safety of the future. Current safety of the future is 40%. Uh, safety... We want to increase the safety. Periodic change of the safety of the future increases by 5%. Inspect the palace. When remove both periodic change of the safety of the future and safety of the future speech itself, will change by random amount. I don't want to do that. Pro-government propaganda. Safety of the t plus 10%. So we get a max change of 10%. Uh, this gives you 5%. Safety... I don't want to spend too much political power because we need to actually save it. So we're going to have to do this. And then we'll send in the army. So we get some more periodic change. So, we also have to keep an eye on this. Government Cornwall relations. England's military was kept weak to prevent us from challenging the government's hold on the country. And we're unable to defend ourselves in a case of rebellion because of it. We need more weapons to outfit our police and army to conduct anti-insurgency operations. And the source is not in England, but with the German government. We must ask the garrison in Cornwall to supply us with weapons from their stocks or from the companies of the Reich itself to keep our government secure. This depends on our ability to maintain good relations with them. Once we open the confront of the resistance, these guns will be issued as infantry equipment to our soldiers. The higher the state stability in Gloucestershire, London, and Sussex, the higher the chances of our guns getting through, and the less will be lost to the resistance. Each month, relations will passively degrade by a small amount. So we have moderate amount of relations. We only have 65 political power. So we can bribe this person for... A large boost to relations. Let's go ahead and boost it up a little bit. And then we could get low. We could only get minus. I'm going to go ahead and grab a few guns. Just a few guns. It's probably not worth getting that right now. But with this stuff here, we have, we are going to play a game with the resistance. That's going to last all next episode, probably. Oh, and we can send in the army because we got extra guns. Good, good, good. Actually, did that change at all? Pro government propaganda. That political power. Safety of the future speech. Plus 50%. Oh, is that a waste? That might have been a waste then. Two days, what's going on? Periodic change, minus 10%. Uh, Hitler names Bowman his successor, more the same it would seem. Okay, so wait, send in the army. So that did nothing, pro-government propaganda. Affects safety of the, uh, future speech, okay. Send in the army, we gotta send more guns this way, just because we gotta get up to plus 10%. That'd be good. Small amount, we are high relations, which is good. And get a few more guns, we only 400, which is not good for us. But, you know what? Oh, it's going down. Ooh, that is not good. 4%. At least do it one more time. One more time. And we are trying to get some more naval XP right now as well. And we have no fuel. Go figure. So let's save, our, save up our guns because we're going to need them. We definitely going to need them. So anyone, anything. Let's read the next focus so we can read the event. Subject matters. What is a king supposed to do in circumstances like these? Edward VIII might not might have been born to a king or to be king, but at times like the present, he wishes he wasn't he weren't the case. Bertie isn't even around anywhere to talk to, and the rebels that support his niece, well, the less said about what they might do, the better. What is the king supposed to do? Or say, when half the populace looks ready to murder the other half. How does he calm those with legitimate grievances against the government's actions? Alec is of no help in the matter. Wallace knows how to convince the upper class, but the speech will be heard by the nation, not merely the aristocracy. Of course, if the German misinterprets what he says, well, it might have been a short government indeed. He might hate the job, but it has fallen to him. Nonetheless, we get some uh, more... Oh, periodic change in safety of the speech. Oh. Okay, well, whatever. As Tim O'Flaherty stared down at the report he was about to send up to the top of the ranks, he wondered, why is it always Monday when this sort of thing happened? The London uprising had started on a Monday, his old dog died on Monday, and now on a Monday afternoon, he was having to report that he might have discovered a plot to th blow up the king at the speech. The newspapers were having, or harping on about, you know. He scowled. It had to be him, didn't it? When he figured out the little thief that had been hiding something, he hadn't delegated or passed it on. Oh no, he'd done the interrogation himself. It was his job to protect the people of London, wasn't it? And something like blowing up the king, oh well. 
O'Flaherty didn't exactly know what the politicians would call it, but his dad might have referred to it as a bloody bad time all around. But on the bright side, oh, what is it? Flaherty, I want to make sure to say his name right, might get some overtime pay out of the whole god dang thing with pay no less. And possibly a promotion too for discovering it. A promotion might pay quite a few quid extra and he could get his girl some of those nice dolls he saw in the fancy toy shop for Christmas. Or maybe get Martha going out dressed to replace the one she bought for the honeymoon. Heck, he could even grab a proper fishing boat if a small one uh, and a chief inspector's pay, but... O'Flaherty sent in the report with a bit more vigor than he had initially intended. We all, of course, have dreams. Well, some of us do. Reach out to the German politicians. We can wait. I need to buy more guns. We could send him to the military, but we're going to not do that. We could inspect the palace. I'm not sure that's going to do anything, but gun shipments most successfully success, successful. I'm sorry, I can't speak right now. So this is the only time I'm going to read it because this happens all the time. Some losses is to be expected when clandestinely ordered munitions go through back channels from foreign super, su supporters, and this is no less true now that it was in the past. We believe approximately half of our requested shipment of firearms and munitions have found their way into the hands of others than their own. A few likely uh, to farmers have need of something to blast rabbits with, but quite possibly a handful into our opponent's grasp as well. However, they don't seem to be aware of any organized effort to acquire weapons on our own part, so this might not be a disaster, strictly speaking. We would do well to be more careful in the future, however, and these times you can take what you can get. Absolutely. So, we have 36 political power. We're losing some. I'm probably just going to spend it on getting a medium gun shipment because we need guns. Now, I would like to do this to get multiple moderate Cornwall relationship boosts over time. We could bribe the garrison, multiple small relationship boosts over time, but for now, as much as I'd love to get this, uh, let's see, you don't get any more political power, so we kind of have, we're kind of stuck with that. All this stuff, yeah, where we're going, we got to make sure we got enough stability, state stability, and support as well. I don't like all that support in Lancashire, though. All right, money, debt, it, it, it's all just numbers, it's all just numbers, and time for a sip of a, of a drink. Ah, good stuff. Uh, Centurion, isn't that the main battle tank? Are we not making any? Are we? Oh, hold on. Oh, as much as we would like to build stuff, we can't. And do you know why? It's because of our national spirits. Our own people's hate. Her Majesty's most loyal resistance, which sucks. Lying in ruins, which gives us minus 200% uh, production efficiency cap. We lose income. We get monthly poverty change. Across the channel, which murders our output, which is terrible. Oh! Uh, this modifier is dependent on how dominant Cornwall Garrison and Germany are with it are in relation to England. Oh, and monthly military austerity. So, and let's read the next uh, one. Next, almost there. The King's Speech is shaping up to be quite the event. Some might even want to break out the champagne and call it a day, but London is practically being isolated in preparation for it. The question on everyone's lips, though, is why? Third Cable Street was years ago, and there hasn't been any real violence in London since. It's almost like the government is worried about something, though. The press, for their part, are busy speculating, issuing declarations of solidarity, but some speculate as whether it's quite necessary to block off all of London and put in curfews for what is at best a theoretical threat. The government, for its part, has decided that they will go ahead with these measures anyways. Give political power and the king and the pauper. The king unloved. King Edward VIII of the House of Windsor eats with his wife as they ate dinner, but his mind wasn't on the love of his life for the undeniability fine meal of the salmon that sat in front of him, but instead on the damn speech. Why on earth had he agreed to it? He knew he wasn't popular, even compared to the low point following the end of the war. Wasn't that an achievement? Right alongside being the first king in 400 years to rule only England. The Prime Minister had sent him a letter of recommendation or recommended topics, but Edward felt they were a bit too obtuse. Supporting the government was all well and good, but there was such a thing as brown nosing. Perhaps he should ask Wallace. She had been terribly depressed not to be able to visit America for two decades, perhaps a bit involvement in the government processes might cheer her up. But as he glanced at his beloved wife's face, Edward knew he couldn't do it. She would worry and fret to make the whole thing so much harder on herself than it ought to be. What Edward was worried about the most, however, was not his wife or the Prime Minister, but that band of terrorists loyal to his niece in Canada. Her Majesty's most loyal resistance, what tosh. But they were very, very real and very dangerous. It was one thing to know that men like the Madman Sterling or the traitorous communist Bill Alexander were out there. It was quite enough to know that some shadowy figure had united them under a common cause to end his miserable reign. Later that evening, as he went to sleep with a heart rolled, roiled by sadness and anger, he looked out of the window, wishing things had gone, had gone differently all those years ago. Why? A tragedy in more way than one. And you know what else is a tragedy? Our GDP decreasing. Look at that. We're below $50 billion. Are you kidding me? Who, Who is running the show here? Like, I know we're in a depression, but bruh, come on. Oh, we can send in the army. Oh, we still have that option. Oh, no, 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 I thought that was, like, sending the army from, like, regular base vanilla Hoi 4 stuff, so. Cool. And we're out of political power. Big sense. But we do have 800 guns, which is a very nice stockpile of guns to have for now. Because we all need it. Now, obviously, this is just England and Wales, it looks like. Is that Wales? I don't think it's Wales. No, it's not Wales. Severn? Never been? Hopefully, maybe go someday. 
But that's disappointing. Oh, we are led by Alec Douglas Holm. Hmm. Oh, man. If you want to read about his backstory, go right ahead right there. Wow, that's a big backstory. Almost there. Almost there, my friends. So, we have chosen a decision, but keeping ahead. Batten down the hatches for the London police are ready for all in all, any and all interventions. Crowds will be carefully monitored and methods of evacuation and detention planned out beforehand. Any suspicious individuals will be kept away from the main viewing sections and there will be exceptionally thorough checks for stashed weapons in the days before the speech commences. His Majesty will enjoy a nice speech, a polite lunch afterwards, and then go home, end of story, without interference from any rebel scum. Those HMM, um, HMM buggers think they can get the best of the London police? Well, they have another thing coming. Ability to decrease the safety of the speech will end. Ready or not... Here we go. Uh, let's keep an eye on this. Uh, I definitely don't want... Ooh, hold on. We got the political power now. I don't want to lose it and not get anything. We could reach out to these. It's a small Cornwall relationship. That's okay. I'd rather have more guns for now, because this is going... We're going to need it for later. Uh, that looks very good. We're already at 6%. I might go ahead and raise this up as well. But the king and the pauper. Edward VIII listened to, the, as the chief of the city of the Indian police, outlined his plans for security with something approaching a dull interest. The King of England didn't really know why the man insisted upon having so many rotations of guards about the location of the speech, but the given recent events, Edward was inclined to listen. Whispers had reached Edward that the resistance intended to kill him at the speech, something he had initially refused to believe. Surely, no group loyal to his niece would kill the reigning monarch. At the same time, a voice sat in his head and asked, What if they were right? Edward hadn't got any sleep for days, Wallace had noticed, and started fretting, only to make the whole affair worse. Edward had resolved to not have her present at the speech. That way, even if something did go wrong, she would not be in the line of fire. As for himself, though, well, as his brothers had always said, so fonding of saying, or I butchered that sentence so badly, he had a duty to attend to. Griselda had memorized every guard rotation. Sterling had insisted, insisted upon it. Alexander had gone over the evacuation route with her and gotten her to warn her brother and mother ahead of time. Once he'd gotten assurances that they weren't likely to turn traitor. The main thing that Griselda had worked on was her throwing skills. Where once she might have had all the skill of some of the tosh, to toff fresh out of a ball, she had now at least a basic grasp of distance and the timing needed before she ran. She was ready and Griselda dearly hoped that would be enough. The die once again is cast and let's send in the army because that's not looking good right there. Well, I don't like slow bottomless change. No, no, no. Ah, 10%. Let's keep it that way. A good English proper way to keep safety at a priority. Words are hard. Are we actually building anything? Okay, so we're not, like, producing anything, but we're building buildings. At least we're building something. Hmm. This white chocolate strawberry truffle coffee is delicious. Is it ready or not? But let's go ahead and uh, move on. The King's Speech. The day has come. King Edward VIII of the House of Windsor may not be a well-like man, but he is nonetheless the King of England. The speech, it would appear, will start at midday and go on for an hour or so before His Majesty attends a late lunch with some notable public figures. Of course, it assumes everything goes to plan. Both the resistance and the government know something will occur, but what exactly is up to the will of God at this point? The coin of history tosses and turns in the air, and the face upon which it lands unknown even by those who threw it. Perhaps the resistance will be correct in their assumption that all the dry tinder needs all it needs is a tiny little spark. Or perhaps the government, well prepared, can deal with them. Oh, guns! Only one way to find out, my friends. No more preparations, Edward goes live. Oh boy, so ready or not, here we go. And we have minus political power. Oh, Flaherty stood in line with his men, a helmet on his head. And for the third time in his life that he could recall, he wielded a revolver in addition to his trusted truncheon. The crowds were thick and noisy, a uh, hail's breadth from the riot, from a riot. As the king stepped out onto the stage, there were a fair few boos mixed amidst the cheering. O'Flaherty gripped his revolver tighter. What were the chances of something coming his way after all? Minute, minuscule, minute. He kept vigilant anyway. Who was to say that if the HMMLR pricks attacked that he'd spare them? Or spare him? What did they understand of the fact that his job put food on the table? Kept his daughters out of the poorhouse or the, off the pole. It didn't matter that he might not like the king, but he had a job to do, and he, as he eyed the crowd of Flaherty, thought he could see something strange. Whatever could it be, man? The third time he gripped a revolver? Man, come on. I know this is England. I know you gotta have a license for that stuff, but come on, man. Third, only third time in your life grabbing a revolver. Woo! I like me a six shot. Mm. <sighs> the economy. Look at that debt. 40 billion in the hole. Like, come on, man. Really? Really? What happened to British austerity? Well, maybe we are doing austerity already. Look how bad it is. Woo! Hmm. Oh, I can't wait to see what happens to the party. 
Uh, let's see. Oh, yep, we're done. We're done. We, there's nothing we can do about it. We got 10% maxed out. Hopefully, everything is safe. We're still training. Um, let's border the Welsh. Because the Welsh oh, have always loved the English. No matter what anyone says, right? Right. Totally. And we only have 7 naval XP. Oh, boy, denial. So, off there, she spotted the woman instantly. Black-haired and skittish. The magnificence was something to keep an eye on anyway, but the bag she carried looked more like a bit large for a purse holder. It was when she reached into the bag whilst staring straight at the king that O'Flaherty just realized what she intended to do. He ran out from the line and made directly for her, barely being two arms lengths away and shouting at her top, at her top, or at her, to drop the bag when he saw her pull the grenade out. O'Flaherty acted not with instinct but with panic and fired three shots in as many seconds. Perhaps if he'd been further away, she might, he might have missed. As it was, all three caught the young woman square in the chest and she went down like a puppet with its strings cut. So the crowd panicked and so did the higher-ups. The king was evacuated within moments of the shot ringing across the square. square. Once they realized what had happened, they looked at the body and found the grenade, along with a pistol and some dynamite besides. First, it was the chief inspector coming to congratulate him, then the commissioner. Finally, a few days later, he found himself in the office of the prime minister. Tim, or O'Flaherty, O'Flaherty, didn't have the heart to tell the man he'd never vote for his party, ho ho, but he accepted the thanks all the same and left positively beaming as the PM inquired as his future career prospects. O'Flaherty suspected that he might be looking at a promotion in the near future. In the end, though, as he came home and ate dinner with his family, whilst listening to his daughters talk about how they could say their father was a hero at school and Martha mentioned that the Crosby's had invited them over for tea next week, Tim O'Flaherty felt like life was good. If only he could get forget the look on that poor girl's face as she fell. God save the king. And now we get a new focus tree. Ah, I love it. Edward's Round Table. Very good. Part of the job of kingship is maintaining the relationships between politicians to ensure that, in theory at least, the government can cooperate even in the midst of a crisis. Alec Douglas Home is by far the most capable prime minister to grace England since the war, and Margaret Thatcher is amongst the most influential of the new generation of politicians and is the voice of the party membership. These two obviously merit invitations to any discussion on national policy. Where it became more difficult is the extremes of the royal party. Arthur Kenneth Chesterton is the main voice of the Jimophile and overtly fascist wing of the party, while Harold Macmillan, or Macmillan is the foremost reformist to hold any degree of influence. Unfortunately, both are likely to refuse to cooperate with the other. We must choose one to deal with. There's the most loyal minister's event, and we get more political power. The Battle of Portman Roads. Interesting. Alright, so here's, here's what we gotta do. You see this, we have options. We have, we need guns. And we can increase our stability if we want to, we choose so, 5%. If we spend 10 guns in each and every single state. So, we actually don't want to unpause it yet because we got to understand this. Eventually, we will have things to do. I mean, I, I did the each MMLR path, actually. I haven't tried this path yet. See, we need state stability in East Anglia, Anglia to be above 60. This one has to be 60 in Gloucestershire and East Anglia. Oh my goodness, call upon the garrison, gain guns, gain guns, uh, Operation Flyswatter. And Sever, and it must be above 75. The garrison grows. Nice. So we have like four or five places that we must, must, must keep an eye on. Uh, East Midlands. Um, let's see. Yorkshire. Oh, we lose 10 support and gain 15 stability in Yorkshire. It's not bad. 30 Cornwall support. Not bad. So, this is what I want to ask you guys. So, we have three options. We can choose towards the north. Operation Wilhelm. Uh, convincing the Midlands. Or focus on the south. Which one of these three do you think I should do? Focus on the south, convincing the Midlands to get some support, or make the enemy, the resistance, lose support in total. What do you think would be best? I'm thinking we probably don't need to focus on the south since, uh, well, we have Sussex, which, uh, let's see, uh, Yorkshire. That might not, that might be good to do. We'll see what happens. But, regardless, focus on the south, Wittishaw, Gloucestershire, and Seven. Uh, let's come over here, decisions. So Severn, Gloucestershire, we have to have pretty high stability down there. And at the very least, Gloucestershire must have uh, 60 and East Anglia. Anglia. So East Anglia is over here. we got to have more stability. It's 50% right now. So let's go ahead and do that for now. Support is pretty good for us. I'm going to go ahead and just increase the support all around here. That's probably going to be good here Instead, I'm going to go ahead and get more monthly support for now. Increase it by a little bit. Good, and that's actually decreasing the blue support, which is good. Anything did I miss? Ah, uh, yes. Oxfordshire, very good. Very good. London, increase it. Increase it here as well. Uh, over here in Yorkshire, we're probably not going to be able to get this. Uh, we'll do monthly stuff. This is why we need so many guns. Uh, and we don't want to unpause it because we have to wait like a month, so... 
So let time go on and groan about the economy because it's not looking very good at all. Still losing political power, which really, really sucks. And of course, the resistance is doing stuff just at the same time as we are. So they might decrease our popular support down here as well. We keep an eye on it. So the round table. Uh, but first, let us do something else. Let's see. Ooh, base war support, more political power, Macmillan's resonance. Uh, that's not bad. Get more stability. We might want to save that for later, though. Uniting Parliament. Uh, Lancaster. Ooh, state stability must be above 75 to conduct this. That's not bad. Talk to the lower classes. Speak with the army. Get more guns. Uh, lose support. That's not bad. I think we probably want to get guns first. So, Holmes' experience. His Majesty has been brought in to the current Prime Minister, Alec Douglas Holmes, to the round table to solve the re rebel problem. Already, the Prime Minister has addressed Parliament calling for unity and order in these uncertain times. His Majesty hopes that the long, longest serving post war minister, Prime Minister, can help him weather England through the crisis. And we have to wait a month before we can do anything here. So, as that time go on very, very slowly. So, his most loyal ministers. Edward was a man under siege. The rebels had tried to kill him and his family before, and they would try again, and the last time was too close. He had to stop those that wished to mill, and he was not without defenses. His home secretary, Arthur Chesterton, a man who would take the fight to the rebels, and how? Police and paramilitaries on every street, checkpoints on every block, a fiery and unyielding determination, that's what was needed. This Prime Minister, Alec Douglas Holm. More soldiers for the extremely difficult situations ready for a, a rebellion, uniting the voters behind the government. A politically experienced man for a situation that required as much experience and action as he had. This Chancellor of the uh, Exchequer, Harold Macmillan. A man whose calmness and reasonability offered a way out of difficult crises. He could unite the parliament and in the internally bickering royal party behind a great, greater goal. And he would try to sway the prime recruits for the rebels away with promises of reform and action. Edward and England was under siege, but neither lacked the ability to defend themselves. Let's put our heads together and figure this out. Because, my gosh, we have to. Oh, man. And we're not even making anything, which is incredibly disappointing. Uh, I, don't, I don't even get liquid reserves, too. Which is a big sadness, but you know what? As long as we can build, right? That's all that matters. Uh, if that's the case, uh, our debt, how much is it? It's, it's a, that's a big deficit, not gonna lie. Mm, I kind of want to say invest more in construction budget. Actually, we can invest more in construction budget. We don't have political power for that. We could spend more on civilian stuff, but uh, I'm not feeling it right now, man. Oh, do we have decisions? No, we don't. We, don't, we can't even, Oh, relations are low. I don't like that. I like high relations, please. Thank you very much. So, ooh, military austerity, we gotta cut the budget again. Definitely have to cut the budget, and oh, we're going that way, going that way. So I guess for now, let's focus on going with, talk to the lower classes, so we, let's get as much state stability in London as possible first. I think that would be good. And, because all these get unlocked eventually, we just have to choose one of these middle three, so. Uh, guns, radical day, losing terror cells. So East Midlands, State stability, as well as London. I think that are two very good to do. Yeah, that would be very good to do. East Midlands and London need more stability. Oh, the Metzstreiter. Oh. And we have the Unity Pact, of course, the People's Own Hate, Across the Channel, which sucks, like we said earlier, and the Holmes Experience. Uh, so, uniting the, volter, the voters. The Prime Minister hopes to unite the voters of England behind the government. Although the Royal Party is still the most popular in England, it is no secret that we have, to put it lightly, influenced the system to keep it this way. Thus, the people are not completely supportive of the government, which explains the growing popularity of the resistance. To turn the public away from supporting the resistance, we must campaign on bringing the people together in these uncertain times and reassure voters that everything, of course, will be fine. In the meantime, let us go ahead and reach out to German politicians because we have very little relations right now. I really don't want to lose any... Oh, actually, we're not going to lose anymore. We actually get more political power now, which is a great thing. So, we don't get East Midlands. They need stability more than anything else. And now we can invest in them, as well as London. London, very good. I think... Oh... So, we got those two. We already got those two done. And then... East Angli Anglia, good. And Gloucestershire. I'm probably saying that wrong. Maybe, I don't know. Gloucestershire, Severin... So we're not focusing so much on increasing support, it's about increasing stability. Uh, here, very good, very good. Oh, we're actually losing some support, that's not good. Um, Veltshire, just going to keep keep increasing uh, state stability. West Midlands, uh, do that as well, you might as well. Severin, we definitely need that as well. And, good, more state stability. And Sussex, for now, go ahead and invest. Let's see if we can get more guns over here. Um, we can probably... Let's let's decrease it by a good amount. Because we won't be able to get these guys probably under us ever. So. 
Uh, so I don't want to. I want to make sure that we don't miss anything here. Good. Let time go on, and maybe we'll read one more book and call it an episode, perhaps. Yeah, I think I want even better relations. We'll go with the medium gun shipment next, maybe. Let's see what happens. Medium gun shipment. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. We have moderate support, so. We only have 985 guns, but that's okay. That is totally okay. Oh, cut that. Yes, good, 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 good. Annual income rate 15%. Ugh, garbage, to say the least. Garbage, garbage, garbage. And, oh, are you still training? Oh, you are still training, but you're not getting anything because you have no fuel, or... Oh, you guys are repairing, maybe. Oh, what's going on? The Croatian Autumn. What will the future bring? A red star rises over Croatia, the government of national salvation. Well, good luck. Widespread insurrection, occupation regime, refugee crisis. Good good luck with that. And I got a couple more guns. Nice. About 300, 250 more guns-ish. So. Oh, that's not good. But we need more state stability, that's the most important thing. And let's go ahead and do... We can do that. Let's do Macmillan's reasoning. His Majesty has brought in Harold Macmillan, leader of the reformist wing of the royal party. Already more hardline and even more small moderate members of the party question whether going soft after this terrible attack will just weaken our position, but His Majesty believes that Macmillan's cool head and intelligence will bring a cool headedness to the round table. But that's pretty much all the time for that we have today, my friends. The king was attacked, but we've managed to get rid of that single instigator. But I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow when we shall read both of these events. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day!